Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2024. Welcome to the reading of lesson number three of the Sabbath School lessons on the book of Mark. It's titled Controversies. It's ready for teaching on Sabbath, July 20. The author is Dr. Thomas R. Shepherd of Andrews University, and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, July 13. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the stories that come from the book of Mark because they show to us more about your great love exemplified in the life of Jesus. And this week, as we learn about sandwich stories, we pray that our hearts may be open, that your Holy Spirit will guide us, that your word will speak to us, and may we see Jesus for who he is and your love as expressed in his life. We pray too, Lord, that you'll bless each of our families. And today I'd like to pray for Ignacio Holmes Patterson in Costa Rica, for Ernesto Espanera and family who are new in the United States, for Jill and her sons, AJ and Julian, for Leonie Williamson and her children in Jamaica, for Daisy Mathinde and children in Malawi, and Dolores Ocampo and Virginia Mendoza and family and Virginia and her family are from the Cayman Islands. Lord, wherever people are listening, in their own home, in their room, in their car, as they walk, as they jog, as they work, Lord, I pray that each one who listens to these stories of Jesus from the book of Mark will be blessed. In his dear name we pray. Amen. Our memory text this week is Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. And here's Dr. Jenny to read it again. I'm Jenny from Harvey Bay, and our memory verse is from Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is also Lord of the Sabbath. Mark chapter 2, verse 1 through to chapter 3, verse 6, contains five stories that illustrate Jesus' teaching in contrast to the teaching of the religious leaders. The stories are in a specific pattern in which each successive story links to the one before via a topical parallel. The final story circles around and reconnects with the first one. Each one of these stories illustrates aspects of who Jesus is, as exemplified by the statements in Mark chapter 2, verses 10, 17, 20 and 28. The lessons for Sunday, Monday and Tuesday will delve deeper into the meaning of these accounts and Christ's statements in them. Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 35, is the subject for study on Wednesday and Thursday. What we will see, too, is an example of a technique the Gospel writer uses that is called sandwich stories. This narrative pattern appears at least six times in Mark. In each case, some important aspect of the nature of Jesus and his role as Messiah, or the nature of discipleship, is the focus. This week, we will read some accounts about Jesus and see what we can learn from them. Sunday, July 14. Healing a Paralytic. Read Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. What was the paralytic looking for when he was brought to Jesus? And what did he receive? Mark 2, beginning at verse 1. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, bringing to him a paralysed man, carried by four of them. 
Since they could not get him into Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowering the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law were sitting there, thinking to themselves, Why does this man talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts, and he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Get up, take your mat, and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. He got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, We have never seen anything like this. The man was paralysed. His four friends, therefore, had to carry him to Jesus. After they tore through the roof and let the man down into Jesus' presence, Mark 2, 5 notes that Jesus saw their faith. How can faith be visible? Like love, it becomes visible in actions, as the persistence of the friends openly illustrates. The man's obvious need was physical. However, when he comes into Jesus' presence, the first words Jesus pronounces refer to forgiveness of sins. The man speaks not a word during the entire scene. Instead, it is the religious leaders who object in their minds, to what Jesus has just said. They consider his words blasphemous, slandering God, and taking on prerogatives that belong only to God. Jesus meets the objectors on their own ground by using a typical rabbinic style of argumentation called lesser to greater. It is one thing to say that a person's sins are forgiven, it is another thing to actually make a paralysed man walk. If Jesus can make the man walk by the power of God, then his claim to forgive sins finds affirmation. Read Micah chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. How does this text explain what was happening between Jesus and the leaders? Micah 6, beginning at verse 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. These religious leaders lost sight of what really mattered, justice, mercy, and walking humbly before God. So obsessed with defending their understanding of God, they were blinded to God's working right before their eyes. Nothing indicated that the men changed their minds about Jesus, even though he gave them more than enough evidence to show that he was from God, not only by letting them know that he could read their minds, no simple feat in and of itself, but also by healing the paralytic in their presence in a way that they could not deny. And so to finish today, how can we be careful to avoid the same trap that these men fell into, being so obsessed with the forms of religion that they lost sight of what really mattered in true religion, as we read in James 1.27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world.
Monday, July 15, Calling Levi, and the question of fasting. Read Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 22. Who was Levi, the son of Alphaeus, and why would there be an objection to him becoming a disciple of Jesus? Let's read Mark 2, beginning at verse 13. Once again Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, It is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, How is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, otherwise the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. Tax collectors in Jesus' day were civil servants under the local or Roman government. They were unpopular among the Jewish population in Judea because they often exacted more than required and became rich off their countrymen. A Jewish commentary on religious law, the Mishnah, Tractate Tohoroth, says... If tax-gatherers entered a house, all that is within it becomes unclean. Thus it is not surprising that the scribes inquire disapprovingly, Why does he eat with tax-collectors and sinners? How did Jesus respond to their question? He doesn't reject it. Instead, he turns it on its head, indicating that people who are sick, not who are healthy, need a doctor. He therefore claims the moniker of spiritual doctor, the one who can heal the sin-sick soul. And should not a doctor go where the sick are? Mark 2, 18-22 picks up a new theme. It is the central story of these five stories dealing with the controversy. When the previous section included a feast provided by Levi, this next story revolves around the question of fasting. It consists of a query as to why Jesus' disciples do not fast when John the Baptists and the Pharisees do. Jesus responds with an illustration or parable in which he compares his presence to a wedding feast. It would be an extremely odd wedding if the guests all fasted. But Jesus does predict a day when the bridegroom will be taken away, an allusion to the cross. There will be plenty of time for fasting then. Jesus continues with two illustrations that highlight the contrast between his teaching and that of the religious leaders. Unshrunk cloth on an old garment and new wine in old wineskins. What an interesting way to contrast the teaching of Christ and the religious leaders. It shows just how corrupted the ways of the teachers had become. Even true religion can be turned into darkness if people are not careful. And so to finish the day, who are those who today might be looked upon as the tax collectors were in Jesus' day? How do we adjust our thinking regarding them? Chapter 2 
Tuesday, July 16, the Lord of the Sabbath. In Mark 2, verses 23 and 24, the Pharisees accused the disciples of breaking the Sabbath. According to Jewish tradition, 39 forms of labour were forbidden on the Sabbath, which in the Pharisees' minds includes what the disciples had done. Read Mark chapter 2, verses 23 to 28. How does Jesus counter the charge brought by the Pharisees? Beginning at verse 23 in Mark chapter 2, we read, One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are you doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he gave also some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus responds, with the story of David's eating the sacred showbread in 1 Samuel 21, verses 1 to 6. Let's just read that. David went to Nob to Ahimelech, the priest. Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, Why are you alone? Why is no one with you? David answered Ahimelech, the priest, The king sent me on a mission and said to me, No one is to know anything about the mission I am sending you on. As for my men, I have told them to meet me at a certain place. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. But the priest answered David, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here, provided the men have kept themselves from women. David replied, Indeed, women have been kept from us as usual whenever I set out. The men's bodies are holy, even on missions that are not holy. How much more so today? So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord and replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. The showbread was removed on the Sabbath, so David's journey may well have been an emergency escape on the Sabbath. Jesus argues that if David and his men were justified in eating the showbread, then Jesus' disciples are justified in plucking and eating grain. Jesus further indicates that the Sabbath was made for the benefit of humanity, not the other way round, and that the basis for his claim is that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Read Mark 3, verses 1 to 6. How does this story illustrate Jesus' point that the Sabbath was made for humanity? Mark 3, beginning at verse 1. Another time Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with the shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked him, Which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Again, Jesus faces controversy with the religious leaders over the Sabbath. Notice, however, that the controversy is never over the Sabbath day itself. The religious leaders want to accuse Jesus if he heals on the Sabbath. Jesus does not shy away from confronting them. He sets up a contrast between doing good or doing harm, saving life or killing. The answer to his question is obvious. Doing good and saving life are much more appropriate as Sabbath activities. 
Jesus proceeds to heal the man, which angers his opponents, who immediately start to plan his demise. The irony of the story is that those looking to catch Jesus in Sabbath breaking were themselves breaking the Sabbath by plotting his death that same day. And so to finish the day, what principles of Sabbath keeping can you take away from these accounts and the challenges that we face in the modern age in keeping Sabbath? Wednesday, July 17, Sandwich Story, Part 1. Read Mark chapter 3, verses 20 to 35. What connection do you see between the two stories intertwined in this passage? Let's begin reading at Mark chapter 3 and verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, He is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over to him and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. If Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first trying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, People who can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him and they told him, Your mother? And your brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This passage is the first sandwich story in Mark where one story is begun and then is interrupted by another story, with the first story completed only afterward. The outer story is about Jesus' relatives setting out to take charge of him because they think he is out of his mind, as we read in verse 21. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. The inner story is about the scribes from Jerusalem charging Jesus with being in collusion with the devil. Today's study focuses on the inner story found in Mark 3.22-30. In Mark 3.22, the scribes bring the charge that Jesus' healing power comes from the devil. Jesus responds first with an overarching question. How can Satan cast out Satan? It does not make sense that Satan would work against himself. Jesus proceeds to speak about division within a kingdom, a house, and Satan himself, showing how absurd such division would be for their success. But then the Lord turns the tables and talks about binding a strong man in order to plunder his house. In this last example, Jesus is the thief entering Satan's house, binding the prince of darkness to set his captives free. Read Mark 3, verses 28 to 30. What is the unpardonable sin, and what does that mean? Mark 3, beginning at verse 28. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying, he has an impure spirit. The unpardonable sin is the sin against the Holy Spirit, calling the work of the Spirit the work of the devil. 
Notice that in Mark 3, verse 30, the reason Jesus makes his statement in Mark 3, 28 and 29 is because the scribes are saying that he has an unclean spirit, when in reality he has the Holy Spirit. If you call the work of the Holy Spirit the work of the devil, then you will not listen to the Holy Spirit because no one in his or her right mind wants to follow the devil's guidance. And so to finish today, why does the fear that you might have committed the unpardonable sin reveal that you have not committed it? Why is the fear itself evidence that you haven't? Thursday, July 18, Sandwich Story, Part 2 Read Mark chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. What experience led Jesus' family to consider him out of his mind? Mark 3, beginning at verse 20. Then Jesus entered a house, and again a crowd gathered, so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, He is out of his mind. A charge of mental instability is quite serious. Typically this arises from experiences where a person is a threat to his or her own safety. Jesus' family felt this way about him because he was so busy that he did not take time to stop to eat. They set out to take charge of him and that's where the outer story of the sandwich breaks off interrupted by the inner story about the scribes charging Jesus with collusion with the devil. A strange parallel exists between the outer and inner stories of this sandwich story. Jesus' own family seems to have a view of him parallel to that of the scribes. The family says he is crazy. The scribes say he is in league with the devil. Read Mark three thirty-one to 35 What does Jesus' family want, and how does he respond? Mark 3, beginning at verse 31. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and your brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and my brothers? he asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This scene may seem strange. If your mother or other family members come to see you, should you not meet with them? The problem was that Jesus' family at the time was not in tune with the will of God. Jesus recognised the truth and in this passage he redefines family. Those who do the will of God are his brother, sister and and mother. He is the Son of God, and those who align themselves with the will of God become his family. The two stories of this Mark and Sandwich story together contain a deep irony. In the inner story, Jesus says that a house divided against itself cannot stand. At first glance, it seems that in the outer story, Jesus' own house, family, is divided against himself. But Jesus resolves this conundrum by his redefinition of family. His real family are those who do the will of God along with him. As we read in Luke twelve fifty three, they will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. And Luke 14, verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. Many times throughout history, Christians have found themselves alienated from their own relatives. It is a difficult experience. This passage in Mark reveals that Jesus went through the same trouble. He understands what it is like and can comfort those who feel this often painful isolation.
Friday, July 19. Further thought. From the book The Desire of Ages, page 286 and 287, we read, When questioned, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath days? Jesus answered, What man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. The spies dared not answer Christ in the presence of the multitude, for fear of involving themselves in difficulty. They knew that he had spoken the truth. Rather than violate their traditions, they would leave a man to suffer, while they would relieve a brute because of the loss to the owner if it were neglected. Thus, greater care was shown for a dumb animal than for man, who is made in the image of God. This illustrates the working of all false religions. They originate in man's desire to exalt himself above God, but they result in degrading man below the brute. Every religion that wars against the sovereignty of God defrauds man of the glory which was his at the creation, and which is to be restored to him in Christ. Every false religion teaches its adherents to be careless of human needs, suffering and rights. The gospel places a high value upon humanity as the purchase of the blood of Christ, and it teaches a tender regard for the wants and woes of man. The Lord says in Isaiah 13 verse 12, I will make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. End of quote. And that brings us to our four discussion questions for this week. 1. What strategies or practices help you and your local church stay sensitive to silently suffering people like the paralytic in Mark chapter 2? 2. Think about how, blinded by hatred, tradition, dogma and religion in general, the religious leaders who rejected Jesus had become so that Even his miracles didn't open their minds to him. How can we, as a people, be careful that something similar doesn't happen to us? 3. How can your local church become family for those whose immediate genetic family may have rejected them over their faith? And 4. Dwell more on the question of the unpardonable sin. In class, discuss what it means and how we can be sure not to commit it. And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Except by Fasting and Prayer by Andrew McChesney. 14-year-old Pale changed after a 14-year-old friend committed suicide. Once outgoing, she sat quietly in the corner and then she began to scream, shiver and shake for no apparent reason. Terrified, she confided that she was being visited by someone who looked like her dead friend. Come with me, the apparition told her. I want to take you with me. Twice, Pale tried to leap off a balcony, but her parents stopped her. In desperation, the parents called Rastam for help. Rastam was a global mission pioneer who had planted a church in a previously unentered area of their Asian city. No one in Pale's family was a Christian except an aunt, and she had told the parents about Rastam. Rastam explained that Pale was not seeing her dead friend, but an evil spirit. We need to pray to Jesus, he said. Rastam took four church members to Pale's home to pray. But Pale wouldn't sit still. She screamed, flung her hands up and down, and stomped her feet. The visitors sang hymns, but every time they mentioned the name of Jesus, she shrieked, Stop! I can't breathe! Someone's suffocating me! Rustam understood that Pael was possessed. He opened a Bible and read about Jesus casting out demons. He prayed. Then Pael became calm. She sat down, talked, and drank water. Rastam hoped that the spirit had left. But later that night, the aunt called him at home. Pale has started screaming and says she's seen her friend again. Rastam was puzzled. 
what had gone wrong. And then he remembered the Bible story in which Jesus' disciples had been unable to cast out a spirit. When they asked why, Jesus replied, This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And this is read in Matthew chapter 17 verse 21 in the New King James Version. Rastam called several global mission pioneers and they fasted and prayed for two days. Then he returned to Pale's house with a group that included a Seventh-day Adventist pastor. When Pale saw the visitors, she tried to flee. It took four people to hold her down, but they couldn't keep her quiet. She screamed as the visitors sang hymns for 30 minutes. Then she slipped into unconsciousness as the pastor preached about the power of Jesus from the Bible. Rastam sprinkled water on her face until she woke up. Someone gave her water to drink. Since that visit, Rastam has returned to worship and pray with Payel and her family every two weeks. Payel has not seen the apparition again. She has returned to her old self. We were not ready the first time we visited her, Rastam said. We only were ready the second time because Jesus teaches this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting.